Hello world, it's been a while since I've made a video and when I do I come to you with a COVID-19 hairstyle which I'm very sorry about but there you go. Right, live with it. Okay, so my video today is all about why the compact digital camera uh, as available roughly from about 2000 till 2010 but I imagine you can still buy them now was crap basically. Now Tony Northrup made a video um, a couple of years ago now saying that the compact digital camera was dead okay and whilst I'm not going to disagree with anything he said in that video I do disagree with the premise the premise being that in my opinion the compact digital camera was never alive and in fact actually to kind of drive that point home after about six months of shooting with a couple of compact digital cameras that I had back in the day uh, just sort of roughly 2002 ish um, I decided that I didn't want to use them anymore they were crap I traded them in for um, a 35 millimeter SLR camera which was the Pentax ME Super and then shortly from there I got fed up with loading film manually so I got one that loads the film automatically for you and does auto wind on and you know that was <laughs> and that was it really but I, I just feel that it is worth discussing why those cameras were so bad and I've got essentially three reasons three reasons why the compact digital cameras of the noughties were crap Part of that is to do with the way that manufacturers try and deceive the public. And so this is how I'm sort of going to proceed from here onwards. In other words, that the compact digital camera was basically an act of great deception on the public. And it's probably responsible for why a lot of people uh, just basically gave up on photography and went back to their mobile phone. The mobile phone, in fact, has got the equation right and I will go into that in, in a little bit more detail and I'll unpack it. So I have three reasons then why the compact digital cameras circa 2000 to 2010 when they were the, at their most popular um, were never alive, why they were crap or why the mobile phone got it right. Number one price versus results roughly 2000 ish you could buy a film compact camera from a reputable manufacturer such as Canon or Nikon or Olympus for about 80 or 90 pounds whereas back in the day roughly three times that i.e. 200 quidish would buy you a 2 megapixel brand name digital compact and basically they underperformed they didn't do what they said on the tin in fact I went on a holiday to Egypt uh, round about that time 2000 and I forgot my film camera and so what I did was visit the uh, the sh cruise ship shop <laughs> and bought myself a few of those disposable cardboard cameras I took some photos with those had them developed and was actually very surprised at the results and then when I looked at my digital camera, two megapixel Nikon Coolpix digital camera results, I th actually those, th th those disposable pictures were actually far better quality than anything that I'd taken with a digital camera that was supposedly you know, the, the high pinnacle of technology at the time. Reason number two, you're not comparing like with like. So when you buy a digital camera as opposed to a film camera, you can't look at the specifications of one to the other and make a judgment as to why a digital camera would necessarily be better for a, you know ordinary casual photography. And, and this is what I'm talking about here. I'm aiming this video fairly and squarely towards the casual photographer that wants a camera that, that when they put it to their eye and take a photograph they get a photograph back that's reasonable quality. Um, film uses a 35 millimeter negative format it's roughly I think it's 24 millimeters by 36 millimeters um, 
which is actually a reasonable size negative. It can be enlarged to at least A3 and still give you acceptable results. Of course, if you put Asda film in it versus Fuji Velvia, you deserve what you get. So if you, if you pay you know, good money for a decent film, you'll get lovely, lovely saturated colors and you know, Asda <laughs> will basically just give you pale washed out crap. Likewise, if you take your uh, film to boots to get it developed, you will deserve to get inaccurate colors because it was basically, you know, people who really didn't know what they were doing developing down to a price. Whereas if you went to an independent shop, they would actually take the time to do it properly. And if there were things that you weren't pleased with, they would do it again, free of charge. But uh, by and large, if you had two film cameras side by side, because they took the same film, which had the same negative size, um, the focal length, i.e. the amount that you could zoom in and out, was directly comparable to another one, okay? You could take a film SLR camera and a, a, a film compact camera. You could look at them and you could say that this film compact camera has a focal length of 28 millimeters, which means it's you know wide enough to get in a group of people or a, you know moderately sort of scenic landscapey picture um, up to maybe 80 millimeters. Okay, that's roughly a three times zoom. So uh, and that 80 millimeters will enable you to get a head and bust portrait of somebody. You know, so reasonably close up. Um, and then you'd look at uh, maybe a, a film SLR camera and you say right all oh, this has got a 24 millimeter lens on it goes up to 105 millimeters which means that it's actually going to get me closer to uh, the subject or further away from the subject than the one that's on the film compact camera you could look at it and you could say right well this film compact camera has got a maximum aperture of f4 Whereas the lens on my SLR camera here has got a maximum aperture of f2.8. And you can say, right, well, actually, yes, the lens on this SLR camera, this film SLR camera, is much better than that one because you can compare the products side by side. Okay. Now, when I first got a digital compact camera, I think I was using a Pentax Optio at that time. I'd abandoned the Nikon Coolpix 2000 because it was rubbish, completely rubbish. I thought I'd try a Pentax Optio because the 3.1 megapixel ones had come down in price a little bit. I was at a meal. Uh, it was someone's birthday party. So one of my relatives came up and asked me, Mark, this says four millimeters to 12 millimeters. And surely that's not right. And I said, well, yeah, because you're comparing it to a 35 millimeter camera. On a 35 millimeter film camera, four millimeters is gonna be seeing the view behind you, and 12 millimeters is gonna be an ultra wide zoom. And that's not what you've got there. You've got what we call a crop factor. And just to keep the figures easy, um, the crop factor is roughly times six. So that means, that the sensor inside the digital compact camera is six times smaller than the 35 millimeter negative. So you multiply everything by six and then suddenly it all starts to make sense. But also, if it says it has an aperture of f3.5, maximum aperture, it really means in 35 millimeter terms, that's an aperture of f18. Which, which will mean that in low light performance, basically like even in here, for example, um, in low light, it will be very, very poor performance. Um, you'll have noise everywhere. Noise are those sort of colored speckles that you tend to see in sort of, um, you know, large patches of particularly blue and black. You know, you just see this and it, and it doesn't even look like film grain. It just looks like, little multicolored speckles and the more that you enlarge that 
the more that that becomes noticeable, the more that your picture will suddenly start look, looking like it's been taken with Lego bricks, okay? Because remember that I said you could enlarge a 35 millimeter negative to at least A3, probably bigger, and not notice a huge impact on the quality difference. You can't do that with those tiny sensors that were on um, those, uh, those early uh, digital compact cameras. Yes, you can argue that someone would sneeze and then suddenly the megapixel count would go up. Uh, but having said that, a pixel is not an exact unit of measurement. There, there, there are roughly a million pixels in a megapixel, but if you've got a tiny sensor, your megapixels actually have to be smaller, or the individual pixels that make those megapixels have to be smaller. So on a four um, megapixel Nikon D2H, which, which has a full frame, which is essentially the same size as a 35 millimeter negative, um, those pixels can be larger. They can absorb much more light, okay? Um, whereas if you put those same four megapixels onto a tiny sensor, then those each pixel will be smaller, okay? So again, it's coming back to this light for light thing. You, you, you can't really look at this camera that says it's got four megapixels as opposed to this camera that says it's got 10 mega, megapixels and say one is better than the other, okay? It's likely to be, but it doesn't necessarily follow. Okay, if you're cramming 10 megapixels onto a tiny mobile phone sensor, then it's going to, it's going to give you particularly perf uh, bad performance, especially when you want to come to enlarge your pictures or the minute that you want to start shooting in low light without flash. And don't get me started on built-in flash. Just don't. It's horrible. Just don't, okay? So, number three. I've called this, <laughs> this point here, lovesick moles. Imagine two blind moles and they're burying themselves into the, the ground and they basically want to come and meet one another and give each other a wee kissy and they go like that, okay? So basically what I mean by that is features that manufacturers are trying to convince us that we want versus the features that people actually need, okay? So let's again go back to, with a film compact camera, you load a film in, you wind it on, or it will wind itself on, put it to your eye, you take a, you take a photograph, okay? And, you know, provided that you've thought about it, thought about your composition and everything, then you're gonna get an acceptable result. They tended to be um, automatic ISO, they, um, you know, and again, I'm not talking about 1970 when you had to change the ISO yourself or sort of put up with 100 ISO fixed cameras. I'm talking about the noughties, you know, by the time we we're in the noughties, those compact cameras were really quite advanced. They had this thing called a DX mark or something like that, which basically meant that when you plopped the film in, it automatically uh, recognized whether or not you'd put a 100 ISO film in or a 400 or an 800 ISO film in and it would set itself up accordingly and it would you know judge the exposures needed for each type of film okay made it you know it made it impossible to load in the wrong film and you know forget to change the ISO setting they would have auto exposure, although there would be a limited latitude there. You probably wouldn't get shutter speeds much higher than about a, a 500th of a second, if that even. Um, but it would choose the correct exposure for you, okay? Um, and they would auto focus, so you'd have, you'd sort of focus your camera uh, on something that's in the center of the frame, where there'd be like a cross or something like that to tell you that's where it is. Um, and then you basically hold the, the shutter button down halfway, you get some sort of confirmation, a bleep or something that tells you, yes, that's in focus. And then if you didn't want that thing in the center of your photograph, then you'd shift it slightly like that, baby. And then you'd carry on pressing the button until um, your, your, the photo has been taken, basically. Um, 
it works. It works very well. I have just completed a three-year uh, photographic degree with the British Academy of Photography and passed it with merits, which I'm very pleased about. A lot of hard work, but basically, you know, even with all these all singing, dancing cameras with multiple hundreds of focus points that you can plop anywhere on the frame, yes, it's very useful, but we were taught, turn all that lot off, turn on the focus point in the center and focus and recompose and it works. Otherwise, you're just constantly fighting these autofocuses, I find. It, the, the camera's deciding itself, basically, where it wants to focus. At least with these film compacts that just had the one focus point in the centre, you could then, once it, the camera's lot focus, you can decide where you want to put that in the frame, rather than just having the camera focusing on someone's nose, rather than actually focusing on their eye, for example, you know? Right, um, yes, so if we toddle over to a digital camera, now this camera here is not a compact camera, this is a micro four thirds mirrorless camera. Basically, this camera is so customizable that if it made the tea for you, you could set it to boil the water to a specific temperature specifiable in one third of a degree Celsius increments. You could decide whether you wanted it to put the milk in first or the milk in last. You could decide exactly how many millimeters of milk you wanted. You could uh, decide whether or not it would squeeze the tea bag twice or five times and uh, you know, how much sugar you wanted, specifiable to exactly how many grains of sugar you wanted put in it. If this camera is that customizable, okay? You would argue that if you had to think about all those factors every time you wanted a cup of tea, that you just wouldn't bother. If it had an automatic tea making mode on here, which basically made all of its assumptions itself according to some pre-programmed algorithm, you'd turn that on and you wouldn't bother about you know all of the all of the micro adjustments that you could make on it. Okay, where this camera and any mirrorless or DSLR camera comes into its own is that it actually gives you control over the things that you really need control over, which are basically four things, which you know I've spoken about. ISO, shutter speed, aperture, and focus. Basically, those four things, those are, those are the only things that you need to really bother about. And everything else, you can, most of the time, very happily live without. Leave the camera to do it by itself. These things are only there just to make it look more fully featured than it is. The hi-fi industry is, you know, notorious for doing exactly that same thing. You know, tea, coffee, chocolate, I don't know. All of these things that you actually, you know, just don't need, you know. You'd find a, a setting in here that says, just don't ask me what this this button does, do you know what I mean? The fault of, you know, where the digital compact camera of the 2000s was that it offered you all those needless things that you didn't need, white balance, the metering modes and all this sort of thing that you don't actually need to be able to take a photograph. But it didn't offer you any of the features that you would need to be able to get some sort of control over the picture that you wanted to take, okay? You had no aperture, shutter speed, ISO, well, you had ISO control. And so despite all the buttons and dials and everything else like that, you best you were just best off leaving the camera to do what it did without any of those, you know, making those things. There was one notable exception, and this is again where the deception comes in again, okay? Buttons and dials and things, they just make the thing look more complicated than it actually is, but they act, but you know, just turn it to the green auto and leave it, okay? Except for one thing. And that was that, what black magic be this? Look, no film. Digital. <laughs> Reminds me of Uncle Bryn on Gavin and Stacey when he was at the, a wedding and look, no film, digital. <laughs> but 
you know, one of the things, you know, the, the, the big selling point of digital photography versus film photography is that you could get far more than the 36 exposures on a, a, a film and that you saw them immediately. Uh, well, I say immediately, we'll come on to that. That's a moot point as well. If I put my 128 megabyte, and I mean megabyte, not gigabyte, if I put my 128 megabyte card into the, the, the socket of a compact digital camera up will plop 750 exposures or something like that and you go, wow that's amazing but then you suddenly realize that what they've done again you as a photographer just a casual photographer that just wants to grab a quick snap of a lovely flowers that's growing in your garden or, or your kids playing around or whatever you don't want to be bothered by JPEG file formats but the JPEG file formats were generally turned down to a lower quality than the camera was capable of doing to make it look like you got more exposures per card. If you were to turn the JPEG up to its highest level, which would typically be called something like super fine or something like that, then that would mean you would get less exposures. You'd probably get something like a hundred exposures. And then, you know, that's what, what's that then, you know? Three and a half films, basically. And it suddenly doesn't seem as impressive. But you are actually getting the full quality. And I quite often digress in these videos, but going back to my COVID-19 hairstyle, when I go and get my hair cut, I can have hair actually cut but I can't have it stuck back on again all right so if you are shooting at a very low JPEG rate you will never make that quality any better and it doesn't matter how complicated your editing software is or whatever you cannot put that quality back okay and because they only offer JPEG and not raw um, which again you know that's too much for the average photographer but you want it set at the highest quality JPEG at least so that you got the very best results that that camera was capable of doing, okay? Again, the, you, you turn down those JPEG settings, the lower the quality, the more it starts to look like it's made of Lego, the more you get all that noisy stuff in the background, all those you know dots and things like that, and the less resolution that it has. So for example, if you were taking a photograph of someone in the garden and there were trees in the background, those trees would start looking like they were made out of tissue paper. They'd have absolutely no detail in them whatsoever. Even if you wanted to blur them out, which is what the camera would be trying to do anyway, because it sees face and therefore background needs to be blurred. But it, it's just not a pleasant effect. You know, again, it's deception. It's no wonder that a lot of people, you know, even when, you know, mobile phone photography was in its infancy, you know, with the, you know, your typical Nokia one with the buttons and the numbers on it and the worms game on it, suddenly it can take photographs and it, they might only be taking less than one megapixel photographs, but all you've got to do is press one button. And obviously cameras on phones have come along a long way. I do argue that you will get much better results of your from your photography if you upgrade to a camera like this, okay? But for most people who just need a quick photograph of their kids or whatever, they're fine. And it saves you carrying around multiple devices in your pocket and everything else like that. They, 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 they do the job, okay? And all you have to do is look at the picture on the screen touch where you want it to focus and Bob's your auntie, it's taking the photograph and you don't need to worry about anything else, okay? And in fact, you can't control anything else on there, but neither could you with the film compact. It did everything for you, but it did it to a high standard. It had the features on it that were just, um, that, that just got the job done, okay? These compact cameras, they were, they were just atrocious okay and you know just hammer home the point about how atrocious they were is that if you were taking a photograph of your child your child is on the beach digging sandcastles and your other one is running around jumping over sand dunes or something and bouncing up and down 
and you take a photograph, you, you try to use a Nikon Coolpix 2000 or whatever to try and take a photograph of them, uh, it, camera goes boom. He's pressed the shutter button. I suppose that means he wants me to take a photograph, does it? Hmm, yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, I might as well at some point get around to uh, writing that onto the card. Yeah, okay, dum dum dum. And then I'll perhaps show it on the screen, by which time the moment's gone. It were absolutely blooming impossible to take a, to take a photograph with anything other than several seconds of shutter lag on there that just meant that any moment that you wanted to capture, and you know, you might think, well actually, I'm out in the Lake District and I'm taking photographs of the beautiful sunset, but by the time that it's taken that beautiful, you've got that perfect moment there, and by the time it's registered that it's gonna take a photograph and write it to the card, then a cloud's come over the sun. You know, so you've lost that moment, even, you know, in, you know, the, what you would think would be the most surreal moments. Whereas, you know, it, the, the DSLRs, even of the noughties, okay, my old Olympus E500 from 2005, eight megapixels, but it used a, an optical viewfinder with a mirror. And basically it was as fast as any film SLR, you had no noticeable delay between you pressing the button and it doing what it needed to do to get that photograph onto the screen at the back of your camera and onto your card. You could not say the same about most digital compacts from those days and I think you know someone who's watching this and is, is, is thinking oh the good old days, oh the good old days it was like Gladys Knight. Remember when? <laughs> Sorry. They were crap. They were crap. What were they, people? Crap. Okay. We have come along a long way since then, and in many ways, we should pat ourselves on the back. Um, and finally, just before I go, I will sort of again hammer my point home. Those film compacts with that little. The, uh, 36 by 24 millimeter negative size is basically what people pay through the nostrils today when they're buying their um, mirrorless and DSLR cameras. You know, you can pay upwards of a grand for a camera that will shoot at that size. Anything less than that, three, four hundred pounds, which is not an unreasonable price to expect a beginner photographer to, to pay on a hobby and, and you get an APS-C size camera which is basically a, a lot smaller, still bigger than the sensor in a compact digital but it's still two thirds the size of a, a 35 millimeter negative and it will still come with a lot of those disadvantages that I've spoken about but I say disadvantages, they're not. You, you'll get fantastic results on, on these things, you know. My Olympus E500 8 megapixel had a, had a sensor that's half the size. That might, the the four-thirds sensor, which is actually in this camera as well, um, it's half the size of a 35 millimeter negative. It does a fantastic job, all right? But those other cameras, the compact cameras, were crippled, they were overpriced, and overcomplicated just in the in the in the sense that they just wanted to deceive the market so again what were they crap see you later bye